Let's go over some blockchain applications so we see what the blockchain is actually good for. In a, the previous video, we talked about that the blockchain, you can think about it as basically a property registration system. And I think that's the best way, that's how I think about it, the best way to, to see also the potential and you can then innovate in that, in that realm. So let's look at through some of the applications. So here we have this, let's say our toy blockchain, and we don't have to understand the block and the nouns and the thing and the hash yet. We will explain that in a later lecture, so stay tuned. But the most important thing is you can put whatever you want here. So you can put whatever data, whatever information you have on the blockchain. You can mint it, you can mine it on the blockchain, and that's there. And that is the key to have property. You have then property of whatever you put on the blockchain. So for example, we can put a non-fungible token on it. And that is basically whatever you can think of, some kind of information, an image, a digital information. Often it's art, that's what NFT refer to. It's an art piece. For example, this very sophisticated art piece, yes, that went for $23.7 million. And somebody called Deepak bought it for $24 million. And now he really owns that thing. Now, this is Deepak has the property right of that image. So there can be many copies of that image. I could just now take a screenshot. Actually, I took a screenshot and put it here into my slide deck. So but that doesn't mean I own the image. Same as I can take a picture of the Mona Lisa. That doesn't mean I own the Mona Lisa. The state of France owns the Mona Lisa. So the property registration system says the state of France owns the honor Mona Lisa. Uh, same as Deepak owns this picture, even so, I copied it and put it on my slide deck. I mean, I just made a copy. But when push comes to shove and somebody asks who owns it, well, we look on the blockchain and the blockchain registers who has the property for it. And here you can put, you know, in who owns what, basically. And there are many other art pieces. For example, this clock, it's a clock that counts how long Julian Assange, a WikiLeaks founder, has been in prison. It was sold for over $50 million. And this year, the merge was sold for $90 million. Now you can have these pictures, uh, but these pictures actually are not on the blockchain. They will show up in your wallet, same as you have a wallet, a traditional leather wallet, from the industrial age. Now we have a digital wallet and you can have all your pictures there, but you can also have a copy somewhere else. Actually, what's on the blockchain is just this here. It's the hash value that refers to it. And we will talk more about uh, the details of how it works. So it's not that this image is on the blockchain. It's only this hash value, the reference hash value that represents, uniquely represents, and it's, it's actually hashed that's why it's called crypto. It's actually not encrypted. It's hashed. This The representation of that is on the blockchain. That's but Otherwise, the blockchain would blow up. For example, you can have a high-definition video and you make an NFT of it, then the video is not stored on the blockchain. Only this hash is stored on the blockchain. And that makes it also very calculable how big the blockchain is. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain, which was the, the first practical application of what we now understand as a blockchain, always fit on the size of an iPhone. So the iPhone storage size has increased as well since 2009. The red is the iPhone storage size. And here in 2017, it became close. But then, you know, Apple increased the storage. So good. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but the Bitcoin blockchain also grows because new ownership registrations are added to the storage, to this ledger. But it always fit on iPhone. So the entire Bitcoin block, if it would be full of videos and images, it wouldn't fit on a phone. But it only consists of these hash and they are stored on the blockchain. Actually, I'm, I will get a lot of heat for making things so, so broad brushed here, but actually not only, not even that is stored on the blockchain. Actually, it's a trimmed version of these hashes that is stored on the blockchain, which is called Merkle trees. That's from the 1970s, actually. And uh, when you are hanging out with the blockchain crowd, it's very important to use the word Merkle tree a lot. I, I don't know, it's just because <laughs> I don't even know because I think it sounds funny, but the, the, the Bitcoin people and the, and, and the blockchain people, they will talk about Merkle tree, Merkle tree, Merkle trees a lot. So 
that's I wanted to include that so you have heard that word. And that basically what that means is that the not the entire hash value, not this entire code gets stored on the blockchain, but a trimmed version of it. But the entire block Bitcoin blockchain fits on an iPhone, and that's the important takeaway from here. Now, what I put into there is, is up to me. I can put whatever data I put in there. For example, I can put information of a scan of a unique diamond and its history on here. That's what some people have been doing. Now, can I put the diamond on the blockchain? No, you don't put the diamond on the blockchain, but you can scan the diamond. And once it's information, once it's a digital product, you can put that. And I put that in here. And then I mint it, I mine it. But actually what I store on the blockchain is this unique reference to it, all this gibberish down here that usually starts with a bunch of zeros. That's what I put on the blockchain. And there are very many, think about the businesses, business models you can create here that you basically register something, some information, and then you can trade it and you can sell it. So now this information of a scan of a unique diamond and its history to exactly know where it comes from, which is often delicate, then this thing can be sold because that's what's on the blockchain, the, the, the registration of this scan. Now you can put other things on the blockchain. For example, this uh, lucky guy here, he bought some NFT sneakers for $134,000. I mean, what does NFT sneakers mean? It's not actually sneakers. He bought a digital twin of a sneaker. And he paid for this digital thing. He paid $134,000, like that is crazy. Why is that? Well, if you're a gamer, you know, that's not so crazy. I mean, it's a little crazy, but you're there, you're in a game, you have, you can buy different things. You buy a skin, a protective shield, or you buy a new sword in whatever game you are, or you go here to the metaverse, to this store and you buy something. And then you hang out in the metaverse and you buy yourself some sneakers. Great, you put them on. Nike, Adidas, you know, Nike, Adidas, they are not textile producers. That's been outsourced a long time ago. They are basically designers. So they also say like, they are very active in the metaverse because they say, well, we design and we can design a digital sneaker as well as we can design something that we let produced by somebody else in order to have the textile version of it. Now, once you buy the sneakers and you hang out in the metaverse with my Adidas and you hang out with them, then what if you go from the store to a business meeting? Well, if it's on the blockchain, you can take the sneakers with you. So this up here, that might be, I don't know, a Metaverse Amazon store. And this might here be the Microsoft Teams or the Facebook meeting room. I don't know. It might be different platforms that you go. But once it's on the Metaverse, you take the property with you. So you take the property of the sneaker with you. And that's how the blockchain and the Metaverse actually intersect. And we will say a little bit more about that. All right. So that's NFTs. NFTs, I think, is the most intuitive way how to think about the blockchain. Any digital information you can you can put on the blockchain. What else do we have? Oh, cryptocurrency, almost forgot. Like, of course, crypto, very important. But as I said, it's it's the killer app of it. It's the first application and Bitcoin was the first application, but, but it won't be the most important one. My intuition, it won't be the most important one. You know, when I, as a, there's a footnote. When I started to research this digital age stuff in the, in the late 1990s, you know what was the killer app for the internet? It was pornography. And the big argument, people were crazy about it because you didn't have to go into a sleazy room to get these tapes out. And you could just like watch pornography on the internet and it's still a big deal. Now, is pornography the, the most important innovation of, of the internet? No, the internet is used for much more e-government, e-business, e whatever, but it starts with something. So I'm sorry, cryptocurrency is a little bit like that. It's the first use case, it's the first application but there will be many more important applications on the blockchain that will far succeed the benefits and the creative destruction force that the blockchain brings, far succeed what, what cryptocurrency does. Okay, so but what is cryptocurrency? Well, again, I have here, you can put whatever data you put in here and you have a Coinbase, that's a technical term, that's basically the wallet. And I know here that and and Anders, he has a hundred something. $100, $100 ADA, $100 Ethereum, 100 Bitcoins. And now I know that already. And now Anders can give 10 to Sophia and 20 to Lucas and 15 to Emily and, and 15 to Madison because I know how much there is in this. So basically the information you put on the blockchain is just a wallet. You could put NFT information on it or you can put that on it. Actually, no, what gets on the blockchain again is just this hash value down here, this gibberish code. 
And then you can transact immediately because it's on the blockchain. If you do a transaction, it gets done immediately. You know, on the stock market, if you do a transaction, it takes about two days. It means that when you buy a stock on Monday, it's not, I mean, it might appear in your interface, but that is just fake and temporary. Most transactions then also fail. It takes two days until it's executed. A bank transfer, a wire takes up to five business days. So this is incredibly slow. If you do something on the blockchain, you still have to mint it. You have to confirm it. Actually, to be really on the blockchain, it, for Bitcoin, for example, I think it needs five confirmations. And it will take some time. It's, if the network is very congested, it can take an hour or something. But often I transact cryptocurrency and it goes into seconds. You really see it you know, goes around the globe. You put it here and it's there in, in a matter of seconds. So, so this goes extremely quick for some cryptocurrencies, which are extremely quick. And that is a big benefit of it. So how did this first killer app, the first uh, use case of the blockchain come about? Well, it was created in the year 2008 by somebody called Satoshi Nakamoto. That's, we, we actually don't know who that is and it came out of the financial crisis. So in 2008, there was a big financial crisis where the states, well, especially in the United States, bailed out the banks. So we used taxpayer money to bail out the banks and many people thought that was unreasonable. So. As a result of that, also of that reflection that we hit there, this paper was published that said, well, we can, can we have a, a finance system without needing a trusted third party, without needing to have banks? And there was the first, this is actually a screenshot of the first transaction I did here for you that was done and the first transaction was 50 Bitcoins. So this is the white paper. We will talk much more about that when we go into the detail what actually the blockchain is, but it's actually very readable. And what it says to accomplish having a financial system uh, without a trusted third party, transaction must be publicly announced. So the, the blockchain is public, which is often a misconception. It's not encrypted, like WhatsApp is encrypted. Encrypted, Like you can see what happens on the blockchain. And we need a system for the participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. So we need a timestamp. And as we need to agree on the past, we need the truth, the truth in the digital age, the, the age of fake news, the truth, yeah, the blockchain can solve a lot of these misinformation issues as well because we have a single history that we agree on with a consensus algorithm. And I'm getting ahead of myself. You will talk about how the blockchain uh, actually works, so stay tuned. Anyways, this was published out of the financial crisis uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto, and we still don't know who Satoshi is. There are Several people claiming, walking around, claiming I am Satoshi and I'm Satoshi and, and here we go and we still don't know actually uh, who they, what Satoshi is, where it came from. What we do know is that Satoshi in Japanese means intelligent history. So you have a single intelligent history and Nakamoto means of central origin, the one who lives in the middle or like publicly announced everywhere nowhere, decentralized. So the intelligent history of central origin, like if that's a real name, whoa, that would be a coincidence, right? But maybe it's not a real name. Who am I to judge? And maybe it's not even one person and maybe it's not a male and maybe it's a team. We don't know. What we know is that these first 50 Bitcoins of the original block have never been touched and never been moved. So we don't know. Could be, it could be that Nakamoto, whatever it is, is dead. And that's actually the prevailing assumption here. And the Bitcoin blockchain by itself, it, it's going, it's a decentralized, nobody really is in charge of it. It's a decentralized self-organizing thing that is organized by everybody who wants to participate in. So there's nobody really in charge of that thing as, as it evolves and continues, continues to register property. What I think will be much more important than cryptocurrency in the long term, and also more important than NFTs, even so they take all of the thunder and are quite easy to understand, are smart contracts. So again, here in the blockchain is a property regist a, a registration system of information, and I can put anything that I want in here. So I put in here a contractual information. And you can think about a smart contract like a really sophisticated vending machine. A vending machine is basically a smart contract. Once you insert two dollars, a drink is released. Now, if the drink only costs a dollar fifty, you insert the two dollars, and then it's already pre-programmed in the algorithm. What are you gonna get back? If the vending machine has quarters, you get two quarters back. But if it only has one quarter, then it's already pre-programmed. 
you will get the nickels and then the dimes or whatever. Or first the dimes and then the nickels. So there is no free will in there. It's basically, it's an algorithm. A contract is an algorithm. A contract is a recipe of how to do a transaction between you and me. And hence, it can be put on the blockchain. It's just information. So we put the smart contract on the blockchain. Now, some smart contract platforms, you can think about them like this. So Ethereum is actually a really amazing vending machine, like a really amazing one. But that's actually how you can think about it. Now you can put bigger things on that. For example, how do we do it nowadays with a contract? If you have a big contract, like a million dollars, you want to buy a house for a million dollars, what would you do? Well, traditionally, if you buy a house, you would give it to a trusted third party. Again, they're like the banks. They're called notaries or escrow, and you give them the million dollars. Then the other one who sells the house gives them the titles and they hold it. And then you check the house and see and everything. And if everybody's in agreement and everything is fine, then the notary takes a fair percentage there and then releases it. This trusted third party, this notary, this escrow held the money for us. Now, if you do a smart contract, you don't need that. You don't need a trusted third party. You actually don't need, you don't need a lawyer to come into agreement. You just write the agreement on the blockchain. And once you click on wanting the house, your million dollars in your wallet is automatically mine and the house goes into your wallet. So it's kind of like you make a purchase on an e-commerce site. That's what it is. And then it's transacted. There's no need for a third party there. It gets automatically taken out of your account and then done there. Now, you still will need lawyers in order to quibble later on to like, oh, actually, that's not what I meant and so forth. And actually, no, no, no. I like was like, I, I misspelled that. So for that end, in order to execute it, I mean, the person can say, okay, you have the property of the house in your registry, but I'm still squatting here. I'm not going to leave. So the blockchain doesn't solve all of that. So it still needs a lot of institutions. It still needs a lot of trust in that sense through the social adaption and through the adaptation of social institutions, through the creation of new institutions that allow us to execute that. But the blockchain provides the registration system, the database. That's basically what it does. Now, if I have property of a virtual property, then I can also put that on the blockchain. So that then, and that's why people start to buy virtual property in the metaverse, then you can do that. And you can put virtual property that just, you say like, well, this property just as an NFT, basically, you put then, you put that on the blockchain. And so this is Ethereum, I already mentioned it. Ethereum is the second biggest blockchain that we have right now. It's basically a smart contract platform. And so Bitcoin was created in 2008 and Vitalik, Buterin created, wrote the white paper of Ethereum. Also, they're both very readable. If, if you're not afraid and you enjoy these, please go ahead and read these white papers. They're very instructive. And it was published in 2014. So that's how young this field is, 2008, 2014. Now, one of the things in the Ethereum white paper, which is striking and had a big impact, is that Vitalik there said, well, one of the smart contracts you can set up, for example, on the Ethereum smart contract platform is to create a new currency yourself. And that lead to, led to a proliferation of many currencies. So many, and that's actually the line of code. So it's four, if, if you're into coding, four lines of code. <laughs> and he wrote that in the, in the Ethereum white paper. And then with these four lines of code, you create a new, he called them tokens. So in cryptocurrency, there are coins and there are tokens. So on the Ethereum blockchain, you can create other currencies and you give them different names. Matic, for example, Polygon, or whatever you want to create, a different token, and you put that, you create that on as a smart contract on the Ethereum platform, and then you have a different currency that has different characteristics, and you can do something else with that. Maybe it's a currency for gamers, and the gamers kind of like use it, and that's it's called an ERC-20 token in Ethereum lingo, and we're not going to go into the details, but that's something very cool you can do. On the on Ethereum blockchain and on many smart contract platforms. And that's been there since the beginning, since the Ethereum white paper. What else can I put on the blockchain? Well, I can put any kind of information on the blockchain. So let's put a document like this on the blockchain. This is the American Constitution. It's a document that describes how we want to govern ourselves. And these documents are important, especially. In, in modern democracies, we need some kind of rule set or like every sports team has some kind of like, how do we actually deal with each other if there's some conflict or something like some kind of governance organizational document that says how we resolve conflicts and how we govern ourselves. So we can put that, of course, on the blockchain because we can put 
all information on the blockchain. And this is called, usually it runs under the idea of a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And again, it's not the entire US constitution that I upload on the blockchain. I just upload this hash value here, which is a fixed size and I upload that, but it, it links. And we will talk about that when we go into what is the blockchain in the, in the next lecture. And we, will, we can link this to this kind of information here. Now, the cool thing is people became very innovative and there are many ways to govern ourselves. So here, this is a hierarchical structure and that's how we usually govern ourselves. Usually on top of here, we put a white male, not, not sure not sure why, but, but that's usually what we do. Uh, and then we govern organizations like that, for example, companies or bureaucracies, uh, organizations we govern like that. But that's not the only way we can organize an organization. There are many different ways you can come up with, actually, that's a very interesting computational problem of how, and, and social science problem, political science problem of how to govern. And people became extremely innovative. These NFTs that I showed you before that were purchased for $50 million or nine. $90 million, actually there were DAOs. There were groups of people that are together and said, we wanna buy this digital good together. And everybody chimes, maybe you pitch in $5 and that's also fine. But then we all, all co-own this image. Maybe you on average own three pixels, who knows? But then we also govern that together. And basically putting these tokens or coins in the middle is, Kind of like saying how much stake do you have in it often, but it doesn't have to be. You can program whatever you want. You can program the governance structure, whatever you want, because the blockchain doesn't care. You can put whatever you want on this blockchain here. And who owns this? Who owns the US constitution? Well, the American people. It says it, we the people. So the same as a DAO, whoever has a stake into that kind of blockchain, it could be a certain blockchain, call it the DAO blockchain, then everybody who has a stake in it owns the information that's on this blockchain. And that's basically the idea of a DAO. So these are some of the lead applications. And in the next video, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper and look into what exactly is the blockchain. So I see you there.